since my life has been spent on the farmlands of Indiana. But here in this land of darkness, I saw that man was close to the earth. Mechanization had not set him free like in gadget crazy America. My purpose in coming to this land and then on around the globe was twofold. First, to satisfy a longing to learn and see new things. But primarily, it was to learn of those working in the fields of spiritual harvest. Often I had heard stories of the missionary and his task, but now I had the opportunity to see for myself. What was it like? What were the people like? How hard is the job of getting close to these people and truly being a help, both to their physical and to their spiritual needs? I would soon find out. My station wagon had been shipped on ahead to meet me at another seaport. After sailing the great ocean expanse, I arrived in this land, so new and exciting to me. My first impressions were lasting ones, as I saw how people, so different from those I had left behind, so strange and with their strange ways, yet again so much alike in their ways, as they smiled and talked and laughed and cried as those back home across the sea. The marketplace, the busy merchant, those buying and selling had all the fervor and enthusiasm as could be seen on Main Street in Indianapolis. These people here on this normal busy day comprised one of the most outstanding scenes of my entire trip in Africa. King Bill, a pilot friend from Laterno, had the courage I lacked and so he went in among the people and I began to warm up to these strange friends. It was a very hot day. The sun was shining brightly and it was a very smelly place indeed with all those fish. It seemed that people were everywhere, busy about their tasks, ready to buy or sell some sort of commodity. I could not help comparing their strange ways with Mom and the kids back home and Bill down the Vandalia Road in Shelby County. Could Mom imagine the daily grinding of grain when she picked up so casually a pound of flour at the supermarket? The many hours spent each day around the world over a grinding stone. I had never seen this before, but of course would see it again and again as I became more acquainted with this land. As I visited here and there that day with King Bill, I couldn't help but notice how well he got along with these people. As he spoke with these African girls, it made me think somewhat of a big brother teasing a sister. Their hairstyles intrigued me. They would have one hairstyle one day, and the next day it would be something else, so I never ceased to lose interest in their hairdos. Seeing this tailor made me decide it would be a good time to start wearing shorts. He did not use a pattern, just began cutting the material. Evidently, fit is no great problem to this particular tailor. However, it wasn't really until my station wagon arrived that I could really get out and see the people. on which I met these wonderful people were many and varied. Soon my spirit began to sense and learn of their spirit in this, their land.
On some occasions, there would be gaiety and laughter as they would entertain their appreciative guest with a dance or song. Other times, it was a simple tune played on an ancient and simple instrument. Their gaiety and zest for life. The needs are the same, and the need to be wanted, to be loved, is the same. Here, perhaps, is one of the most colorful characters I have seen any place. The richest man of all the Maasai tribe. He has 53 wives, 20,000 head of cattle, 1,900 donkeys. An inquiry was made as to the number of children he had. No one seemed to know except that he had 30 Morani, which means young men or young warriors. I saw at least one of them. You never had to look far for a crowd to be in a picture. To watch these people work will never cease to amaze me. Their enthusiasm and their zeal, working long hours to accomplish what I had been used to doing in a relatively short while. It was always discouraging enough for me to cut crossways on a log, let alone going lengthways. This sawmill hardly had the marks of progress and labor-saving devices, but it did manage to cut the log. And after all, that was the goal here as well as in America. The sewing machine seems to be a piece of equipment that has invaded every corner of the globe. It may be on the sod floor of a hut far back in the bush country, but still, it is doing the job. How anxious the people seem to be to greet a stranger in their midst. They seemed so anxious to share their way of life and to share their loved ones with anyone who would show an interest. So it was with these dear people, as in every corner of the globe, there was a life to live and a job to be accomplished. The day would often begin with the fires being kindled. Then the women would pound the yams or food for the daily meals. Baby must be washed. This youngster got a good scrubbing, if I ever saw one get it. The new roof must be put up while the thatch is yet dry. On one occasion, I met these girls busy cutting palm nuts. They also demonstrated to us a ladder which they used to climb up into the trees to get these large clusters of nuts. They felt right at home as they chopped away with their huge machete or panga knife, as it is called in East Africa. Oh, watch out for that finger. How convenient to be able to simply turn a water faucet on, or at the most pump a few strokes on the farm pump. From this deep well, African women come from long distances each day to draw their supply of water. They pour the water into these mammoth-sized gourds. This is the standard water container in Africa. I'm sure if you knew their language, you would pick up a lot of neighborhood gossip here. Many jobs are meted out from the various government agencies too. The roads must be kept passable and free from irritating stones as much as possible. Many jobs are the same, but the methods, well, that's something else. When we met these fellows, we were not close to a village or town. Yet these two men were patiently dragging this strange road maintainer. And so, wherever I went, there were people to meet and their ways to learn about. So often we Americans only want to show others how we do things. It's wonderful to see how others manage. The grace and concern of this girl as she made sure her friends looked right. Everywhere, men and women wanted their best side seen and recognized. Perhaps these people do not have as much to be proud of as we often do. But they did have each other, the land and its fruits, and they did the best they could with what they had.
There have been special projects that have come to aid these people. Help has come to this land in many ways, through medicine, agricultural help and direction, schools, land development. Rubber plantations. This great Firestone plantation is the largest in the world. This type of industry employs many and helps to utilize land that for centuries has laid in waste. Tornata, the official name of this Laterno Mission industrial project down the coast from Monrovia. You can only get here by plane. One half million acres has been leased by Mr. Laterno from the Liberian government. A white man is not permitted to own land. Since it began 10 years ago, this project has grown in size to employ 75 national Liberians, as well as meeting an agricultural and industrial need. This project has also maintained 17 national pastors and two full-time evangelists. This great enterprise has brought in special equipment designed for a special purpose to develop new lands. This giant tree crusher lays flat jungle area in a matter of a few hours. This machine weighs 68 tons and can roll down a strip of jungle 12 feet wide. However, Nature does have a way of even holding up such a great machine as this. Bees. Thousands of them swarm and chase this operator to more friendly surroundings. They found 125 bee stings. I suppose the greatest humanitarian aspect of the missions would be through medicine, the warm hand of help and comfort that these dear people then begin to seek the real needs of their hearts, the spiritual need that only a personal God can satisfy. So as the mission continues to meet the physical needs of these people, the missionary is also planting the seed that will eventually meet the deep spiritual need. This mother has given birth to her newest child. Now she is taken in love to her home, encouraged and comforted and assured that these mission people will be ready to give a helping hand whenever she needs it. Not many African youngsters are born in a surrounding like this. People that have been encouraged by the missions now come and participate in gospel services, Bible schools, and special training institutes. These ladies bring up their offerings which take the form of produce which they have brought from their land. This gathering seemed to be the African equivalent to our American Ladies' Aid Societies, as near as I can describe it. Africans come here and receive all kinds of medical attention for a very small amount of money or for nothing if they cannot pay at all. Thus the seeds of love and comfort are sown in the hearts of these needy ones. A few years ago, one of our mission doctors received a citation from the Queen of England for outstanding service to the people of Sierra Leone. The ceremony took place at the governor's mansion at Freetown. Elizabeth and Philip were both there in person. There is much leprosy. Here at this Africa Inland Mission Leprosarium at Colondoto, we feel with them as lepers sing for us.
On one day of the week, the women and girls come and sit around in the hot sun, waiting patiently for their leprosy medicine. And on another day of the week, the men and boys come. Leprosy is a dreaded disease that affects so many of these people in all parts of Africa. This was a touching case when this woman, so handicapped, was making a little bit of money by carrying water on her head in a can known as a Debbie in East Africa. Here is an example of the horrible effects of leprosy. There were a great number of children gathered together at this scene to receive leprosy medicine. They line up and wait patiently until their turn comes. One little fellow here has his mouth open quite some time before he is ready for the medicine. He wants to make sure they don't pass him up. Education now is leaping the great walls of illiteracy. Over 100 of these little girls have left their primitive mud huts and have come here to this mission boarding school to live and to learn. It's typical of them to gather around very closely so visitors can touch them on the top of their heads. That is a tribal custom as a form of greeting. This Lutheran mission in Tanganyika has had a great influence on these boys. The crippled boy here was kept in the home of an African pastor. This African pastor received no pay for keeping him. The boy's parents had abandoned him because he was a cripple. And so the missionary continues his unending task to get closer and closer to the hearts of his people around him. It had always seemed strange to hear missionaries like these, when speaking of their recent furlough, tell how homesick they had become for Africa. But only when the heart of the missionary is wrapped up in his work and his life is literally given to these people, only then can you understand. Such is their devotion to the cause for which they are giving their lives. And so slowly and with surety, the light comes to a dark continent. And this light is seen in no better place than on the faces of those who have truly found this light in their own lives. The light of the world, Christ Jesus can now be seen in these faces that once were in darkness. Dr. Paul White has written a series of books called The Jungle Doctor Series. And here is Pastor Dowdy, a real life character of this series. He served as Dr. White's medical assistant. This young man has now gone to be with his Lord. He stood strong as a Christian and in the heat of political and satanic persecution, he became a martyr. For many centuries, Africa has not been strongly affected with the inroads of Christianity and Western thinking, and therefore can often be seen, here by the roadside, a reminder of the dark past, which still remains a very real part of Africa today. A reminder of the darkness that has shrouded this land for years. The witch doctor, truly a very colorful character, he sat on the ground in the hot sun going through his incantations. And what a sight it was. He had magic charms and was quite a performer. 
South of Mwanza, another young missionary helped us to contact this medicine man with the blue plumes. This man, with his remedies gathered from superstition and from the spiritual forces, would rule this land were it not for the light that has begun to come through improved education and through the efforts of many mission groups across the land. The pagan leader is now being confronted by his followers with questions and more questions that are now beginning to crack down the great dark corners and let in the light. Both the physical and spiritual light to a hungry land. The witch doctors and secret societies still maintain a great control over their followers. The pastors are accused of preaching a false god and often must take a stand that few Christians in North America are forced to take. In religious groups in America, we often speak of having problems, maybe spiritually or maybe otherwise. And yet my impressions were that actually not very many of us really do have any problems at all. The difference between pagans and the heathen element of Africa and those who come in contact with missions and have been converted to Christianity is obvious. Truly, there is a great difference. Were it not for the concern of millions around this globe, Africa would be a dark, undesirable continent today. Africa long has been referred to as the Dark Continent, and truly it has been just that down through the centuries. The term Dark Continent applies yet today, yet how much greater would that darkness be had it not been for Christian missions? And now that darkness is slowly but surely being replaced with light, and the white fields are slowly being harvested and the lives of many of these men, women, and children are being filled with the only light that can truly expel the darkness.